right, y'all. Peace and blessings. God bless y'all. I'm Jarvis Kingston, and I hope y'all doing all right, staying strong and solid in these times that we're in. I pray that you have repented and that you are baptized. I pray that you are safe, protected, and prayed up. And I just hope that whatever situation that you're going through, that the Lord is with you, that he guides you, he protects you, he looks out for you, he comforts you. I pray that your mental health gets better. I pray that the Lord gives you a peace of mind and you have that perfect peace in him. I just pray that you become more strong and wise in the Lord. I pray that you stop backsliding and you turn from your ways and you stay on that narrow path. You fight the good fight of faith. You keep your eyes on the prize. You keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. You keep seeking his face. All right, I just pray that you keep doing Father's business and Father's will for the rest of your life forever, y'all. Even when the sun comes back, amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Let us thank the Lord for another day. Let us thank the Lord for food in our belly, clothes in our back, a roof over our head. Let us thank the Lord for protecting us coming in and coming out. Let us just thank him and praise him just for who he is and how amazing he is. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Welcome, everybody. Yes, yes, y'all. Thank you all for listening, support. I truly appreciate all of you. Greetings, body of Christ. Shalom, family. I hope y'all are staying strong and blessed out there and holding it down day by day. Amen. And I pray that you keep staying encouraged and uplifted in the Lord and that your trust is in him always and forever. Amen. Welcome, everyone, all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all languages, all tongues, all four corners of the earth, all faces, all races. Whether you're an Israelite or a Gentile, it is all right. Whether you are chosen or adopted, it is all right. Let us gather and praise the Lord. Let us fellowship. Let us all just embrace how awesome and amazing he is. Reflect and think about everything the Lord has brought you through and just just rejoice about how amazing he is. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all got to be more appreciative of things, got to be more grateful. It could have been worse. It could have went a way worse direction, but God saved you with his outstretched arm and his mighty hand. Amen. Yes, yes, let us love the Lord, our God, for all of our mind, heart, and soul, strength, and might. Let us love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let us obey the gospel. Let us obey the law, statutes, and commandments. And let us just stay faithful. Let us stay in alignment. Let us stay consistent. And let us just always be steadfast, people. All right, got to be firm, people. Got to be firm, all right? The Lord needs his people to be stronger, all right? The times get more strange, but we get more stronger with in, in this battle, in this spiritual warfare, okay? Yes, yes. So I hope that you all had a blessed week and that you all have a blessed weekend, a blessed Sabbath as well. And that, you know, summertime now. So I hope that you all are um, working hard, enjoying yourselves, traveling, going on trips, getting out your comfort zone, vacation, whatever you're doing. Um, I just pray that things get better for you and you take your time out to enjoy your life, have a merry heart. You know, be cheerful and stay encouraged through whatever situation there is going on, all right? Yes, yes, y'all. So in today's message, we're going to continue our Bible reading series, okay? Now, in today's message, we're going to start off with the book of Matthew chapter 17, all right? In this reading, we'll start off with Matthew chapter 17. And from there, we'll close out with the priestly blessing. We'll close out with prayer. And then we'll close out with giving all the praise, honor, glory to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And praising his only begotten son who died for our sins. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So reading this New Testament, reading the gospel has just been amazing, man. I love every word of it. I love every chapter of it, man. It's just more amazing the more you read it. Amen. So let us be a doer of the word, okay? So let us start off in the book of Matthew, chapter 17. Here we go. Matthew 17, chapter 1, verse 1. The Transfiguration. After six days... Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it it is good for us to be here? If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up. He said, Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. 
In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. The healing of a boy with a demon. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son. He said he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. O unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here. To there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. The Temple Tax. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two Drashma tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the Temple Tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From who do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from their own sons or, own, or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt. Jesus said to him, but so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the, fish, f- take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Mm, look at that. So that's the book of Matthew chapter 17 reading right there. Very brief, interesting read right there. So when we review the book of Matthew chapter 17, you got to think about the transfiguration process, which is a very spiritual, powerful encounter. Very supernatural, very, uh, very different type of thing right there. Because it says when he was going through the transfiguration process, Elijah and Moses was near him. And he, they were there to witness and be there as well. And it, it brought up some theories and speculations that people thought because of this, that Elijah and Moses were the two witnesses because they were there to witness Christ's transfiguration process. But uh, when it comes to regarding the book of Revelation, but when you really read uh, the book of Zechariah, chapter three and verse four, the two witnesses are actually uh, Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. So those are actually the two witnesses. But every individual plays a huge part in prophecy, whether it's in the Moses and Elijah, Christ, the prophets, um, the high priest, the kings, they all play a, a certain part throughout Israel and throughout fulfilling prophecy, okay? So as we continue further in the book of Matthew chapter 17, uh, it's interesting, Peter, you know, Peter was like, he wanted to put up three shelters for one for Christ, one for Moses, and one Elijah. And then a, a bright cloud came up upon them, and it was the most high speaking to all of them in that presence and saying that this is his son and whom he is well pleased. And then they all got scared, and Peter had his face down, and then the disciples, they all all their faces went down, and Jesus came to them and was like, no, get up, don't be afraid. <laughs> they feared God's voice so much they just couldn't stand, right? So... That's how powerful the presence of God, the voice of God is. It could just make you drop on the floor instantly and just bow or hide or whatever. You know, fearing the Lord is important. And they were never shy about fearing the Lord, fearing the Lord and expressing it. But that time period was nothing bad. So Jesus just encouraged them, told them to get up. Right. And then as the transfiguration process went down, uh, went went through with that moment, um, Jesus was just foretelling, telling them. Yeah, so he's just breaking down how it's going to go with him being raised from the dead or what have you. And then the disciples asked about why they said Elijah must come first. And then Jesus was just saying how he's going to restore all things. Um, and then he goes more to say, but he has already said that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything that they wished, you know. So when it comes to Elijah restoring all things, it was in a sense of an order of his ministry, his doctrines, the way Elijah went about the walk of God was basically an example that was set back all in that Israelite time period. Because remember, Elijah pulled up around the time of Jezebel, remember, and she was slaying and killing all the prophets. But Elijah came back down there to prophesize 
and to bring back the fear of the Lord and to bring back his ministry, his doctrine, repentance and things of that nature and to walk in the power of God. So Elijah was all of that into one. And it was also passed down through to all the way to John the Baptist because Eli John the Baptist basically had that um, Elijah type ministry, that Elijah type uh, doctrines, you know, basically. And John even had his own disciples as well. And we all saw what happened with John when John got beheaded for it. So that's what Elijah was saying. That's what Christ was saying when Elijah restored all things. He's basically saying how he restored putting the fear of the Lord back into people. He restored proper ministry, the proper word of the Lord. Um, and he restored the, the walk in the order of it as well. You get what I'm saying? Because many prophets were um, false prophesizing in the ancient times and not sticking to God and not being a good messenger. But Elijah had to restore that. Because remember, all throughout Israel, the history of it in the ancient times and the kingship of it, Israel kept going down the drain. As far as when it came to his kingship, his dynasty, his rulership, prophets, priest, all of that, the, the power of God, the obedience, all that was going down the drain um, generation by generation. So when Elijah came, he brought all that back in, into one, and it was still passed on all the way to John the Baptist. And then Jesus says, hey, what y'all already did to Elijah, y'all already did to him. He was speaking in that reference to us, John the Baptist, because we all know how that played out for him. <laughs> you know, when you're really about true doctrine and true word of the Lord, um, it will cost you your life. You get what I'm saying? So John the Baptist was basically a martyr, and so was Christ as well, all right, and many more others. And we will too, okay? So um, just understand that's a very powerful thing, and a, a we got to stick to, all right? And when you go further into Matthew chapter 17, uh, it was dealing with the healing of the boy with a demon, and the disciples couldn't get it out of him. And Jesus, you know, he was a bit angry about it and said, oh, and believe in a perverse generation. You know, he was just a little frustrated out because you know, the people lack of faith. You know, like the lack of faith actually angers the Lord. Because remember, faith is what pleases him. So imagine what no faith does to the Lord. It, it makes him unhappy. It makes him angry. You know, we got to have our faith in the Lord and the faith in his power. The disciples, they didn't... Uh, had faith. That's why they couldn't get it out, that boy. Um, another thing Jesus brought up, the mustard seed uh, reference. He's saying, if you got faith like a mustard seed, you know, you could tell this mountain to move over here and it'll go over there and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Amen. We got to have that mustard seed faith, people. Mustard seed faith. Amazing faith. The type of faith those people had to want to be healed, want to be restored, that's the type of faith we have to have. All right. That faith of wanting deliverance, wanting the truth, wanting to be restored, wanting to be fixed, wanting to be helped, that type of faith. All right, so it went down through there. Let's see. And then the whole temple tax situation, you know, they were all confronted about that. But then uh, Jesus told Peter to uh, go by the, by the water and go get that fish. The first, ki fe the first fish you catch and take it out of there. So that's just the power of God of just like, wow, you're getting money out of a fish's mouth, right? When you're talking about the supernatural, man, you know, it goes way beyond human imagination, all right? So that is the reading of Matthew chapter 17. What I would like to do before I go into Matthew chapter 17 is I would like to read the commentary that's also included into this as well, okay? So let us go into this commentary real quick before chapter 18. Today's Bible reading, Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. Recommended reading, Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 20, and also 21. The book of Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And also the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. And also the book of Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, okay? So the title of this commentary is called Fear on the Mountain. In the majestic Rocky Mountains of Colorado, the peaks of more than 50 mountains exceed 14,000 feet above sea level. While some people set the challenging goal of, a climbing, of climbing every 14er, 14er, others settle for a drive to the top of the two of these mountains, Pikes Peak and Mount Evans. However, no matter how they get to one of these mountaintops, people can enjoy a view from the summit that brings new meaning to the claim that on a clear day, you can see forever. Imagine hiking up a mountain with Jesus. 
But instead of a distant scenic view, you see the Son of God in his dazzling eternal glory. That's exactly what happened during the mountaintop experience of Peter, James, and John. Theologians use the term Jesus transfiguration to describe what the disciples witnessed. How did they react when these three disciples heard God's voice booming from the bright cloud? They fell to the ground terrified. How would you react to such an extraordinary event? Seeing Jesus transfigured before your very eyes and hearing the voice of God with your own ears. Fear actually seems like a reasonable and natural response. Just as important, how would you describe your current relationship with God? Does fear ever hold you back from getting close to him? Do you ever balk at listening to his word because you fear what it commands you to do? Jesus wants to say to you just what he told Peter, James, and John. And John, don't be afraid. To take away, what spiritual mountaintop experiences have you had? What fears hold you back from getting close to God? Why? When Jesus assures you with the words, don't be afraid, do you listen to him? What can you do to give yourself more fully to Jesus? In other words, faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. Augustine. So that's the commentary regarding the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, regarding the transfiguration process. Transfiguration process. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven. All right, the book of Matthew, chapter 18. Here we go. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Mm. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Mm. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gog it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the, to the fire of hell. Mm. The parable of the lost sheep. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. Hmm. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave the ninety nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about ninety nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Hmm. A brother who sins against you. If your brother sins against you. Go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted, to, who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all that he had, be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. 
The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denaries. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and held and, ho- and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Mm. Ooh, man, man, man. Sheesh. That's the book of Matthew chapter 18 right there. Man, man, them parables, right? Them parables always hit, right? <laughs> so that was a good read. Now, when you read Matthew chapter 18, um, you know, the disciples, they always had those like conversations, those competitive debates and those vain arguments about like, well, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Who's the greatest? And they were basing it off of a like elitist mindset, like a status type thing, like who has more power of God or who holds what ranking and this, that, and the other. And Jesus was breaking it down to him saying, it's not like that. It's not the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus grabbed a little child and he stood him among them. And he said, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So basically he used the child as an example because children have an innocence about them. They have a more openness and enthusiasm of wanting the things of God or wanting to seek life. They just have a lot of joy, a lot of energy for things and are willing to be told what to do and willing to follow certain things. The thing about a child, um, they're kind of like sponges. You get what I'm saying? So they absorb things. They just take things as they are. And depending on what type of children you have or see just in general, it's important to have like a childlike approach and a joy and a cheerfulness when you enter something, you know, when you don't have any blame or guilt, basically, because every adult, all of us got like some guilt, some things we've done in our lifetime, you know what I mean? And some people have stubbornness and a hard heart. Some people are unrepentant. You get what I'm saying? So that's why Jesus couldn't use an adult as an example for it. He had to use a whole child because the child is innocent. They're blameless. You know what I mean? They don't have a bad conscience about things, you know? Like if you ever see a child with a good attitude, um, they'll never question things or argue or debate with you or want to go back and forth with you about something. They'll just do it with no problem. And that's the type of example Jesus was setting as far as that goes. Because when someone is young, good attitude, got their head on straight, not corrupted, um, they could be used by God easier compared to someone who's unrepentant, who's stubborn, who leans on their own understanding. You, you get what I'm saying? And um, I just love how he used that example, you know, and he just used that child as an example and saying, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes little ones to sin, it will be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be thrown down to drown in the depths of the sea. So he basically saying like, hey, man, got to keep these babies pure. Got to have a pure heart, pure approach when it comes to the kingdom. That's how you really approach it, with a purity. You get what I'm saying? And you can't cause the little ones to sin. You know, that's why it's important how we carry ourselves and how we act and conduct ourselves around children, because you never know who's watching. You never know how they might absorb it or take it from their own. Um, A lot of times when we see a, a bad child or a child who might have certain things about them, a lot of times it's what's influenced by their parents that make the child like that. So if you meet a child who be cussing or probably think they grown or they, they get that from the energy in their house. They get that from the examples that's in their households. You get what I'm saying? Because a lot of parents, they bring these children to the world and just be cussing around them and doing this and that and uh, toxic behavior and trauma, all types of crazy stuff. Uh, alcoholism, domestic violence, arguing, cussing, all types of, you know, degenerate behavior and negative examples being set. So that rubs off on a child. And now that child Those generational curses are passed on to that child. You you see, and it makes the child sin. This is what Jesus was getting at. See, we can't pass off generational curse to our babies, man. No, we got to break them cycles. We got to break them strongholds. We got to break them chains. And we got to make sure we keep our children on the path of the Lord. Teach our children about prayer, 
uh, Bible study, worship, things like that, man, you know, because, you know, children are important, you know, and Jesus and making a reference, like saying, hey, if you reject this child, you rejected me, you know, so he always puts that onus and accountability on us on how we go about things and examples that we set, man, you know, because children are innocent, they're delicate, they're very uh, pure in, in that sense. So once you corrupt a child and make a child sin, it's like you're doing the devil's work. You get what I'm saying? And you see how the social media influence and how pop culture, it makes children sin. Well, all these things going on in the world, all this stuff, you see how our children are just so misguided and unloved and what have you, you know? It's like their innocence, their childhood is being stripped from them. This world is just moving too fast, too demonic, too evil. And the influence of it, it just rubs off on the children too heavy and too harshly. So we have to spread that gospel to these babies, too. We got to spread the word to these these children, man. These children really need the Bible. They really need to pray, man, because um, Satan loves attacking children. He loves doing that stuff. You know, you got to understand spiritual warfare and knows who to target. He wants to target everybody because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he goes to and fro, just like the book of Job says, you know. But um, he targets children, man. He targets children, um, you know what I mean? So we have to really guard our babies, protect them. All right, Jesus told us to look out for our children, man. You have to, okay? And he goes more further about, uh, you know, uh, you know, if your foot causes you to sin, uh, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to sin, gog it out. You know, he goes into that re- repetition as well. as saying it's better to come into the kingdom, um, into life with one body part missing or what have you, than to go have your whole full body in the lake of fire and eternal hell. You see what I'm saying? So... Jesus really stressing the emphasis of that. And then also the parable of the lost sheep. I love that parable a lot, too. You know, if there's 100 sheep and 99 stay on the hill and one go missing, that he'll come back and go look for that one. And that's just the mercy and the love aspect of how much the Father loves us, you know, how much the Lord loves us. He'll go out his way to come back and restore us, bring us back together as a whole, you know. And it's all prophetic, too, because remember, when you read like the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Ezekiel, it constantly talks about the restoration of Israel, how the Lord will gather us and bring us back to, as a tight knit as once. And the Lord's going to go all four corners, all four corners of earth to get us all back together. See what I'm saying? So that's why that parable of the lost sheep is very powerful. All right. And then, you know, Jesus goes more into detail about. You know, if your brother sins against you, and this is talking about the forgiveness aspect and letting things go and not counting things over people's head and basically saying, you know, what you bind on earth is what you bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is what you loose in heaven as well. And the way you treat a brother, a neighbor, a friend, stranger, all of that is important, man. It's very important how we do it, one another, how we forgive one another, how we move past things, how we have reconciliation, how we reconcile things, man. It's very important. Can't walk around with beef and guilt. And uh, regret, resentment, bitterness, you know, we, that, nah, there's no room for that. Okay, God is holy and unforgiveness is unholy. It's filthy and there's no place for that in the kingdom, all right? So we got to get it right, man. Before you pray, before you give an offering, before you read the Bible, before you do anything, make sure you ain't got no unforgiveness in your heart. Make sure you got a clean slate, people. You Make sure you clean it up with people down here, man. Um, many people be in different scenarios, situations, and environments where a person's personality, you know, it could throw you off or whatever, but love covers all sins. Love covers all transgressions. Forgiveness heals everything. All right. That's the power of forgiveness. Um, you know, always trying to get back at somebody, always trying to get even, revenge, that, that vengeful spirit, that's not on us, man. You know, and especially towards your brother or your friend or your neighbor or a stranger, whomever. The Lord teaches us how to treat each other, man. And forgiveness is a, a whole entire... Forgiveness is one of the foundations of the gospel, honestly. You know what I mean? And Jesus is like, hey, man, you know, how you treat people, that's how the Heavenly Father going to treat you. Straight up, man. Your heart is important, man. Make sure you don't have nothing against anybody in the heart. Amen. Let's be more mature about things and grow up, okay? So that's the book of Matthew, chapter 18, reading. Now... Let us go into the book of Matthew chapter 19, all right? The book of Matthew chapter 19, here we go. And just before I go into Matthew 19, I just want to add just one more, a little towards the end of Matthew 18, because 
you know, it's funny because Peter asked Jesus, like, well, how much times should a sin be forgiven or what have you? And then there's a, well, if someone offends you seven times and Jesus is like, seven times 70, you get what I'm saying? Because you shouldn't hold count of how much things someone may offend you or how much offenses there is, right? Because we sin before God numerous of times throughout our lifetime, right? Even to this day, like we, we struggle with sin, with spirit and flesh battles every day, right? But we be wanting God to forgive us for everything we've done. That's why we have to have that forgiveness towards everybody else. If we serve a, if we serve a loving kindness, tenderhearted God, we serve a merciful God, a gracious God who loves us and forgives us, what's in the way of us holding us, um, forgiving somebody? What's holding us up? What's getting in the way of us forgiving people? What's the stumbling block? You get what I'm saying? It's pride. It's immaturity. It's petty. All right. So get that unforgiveness out your heart, people. Okay. Now let us get to the book of Matthew chapter 19. Divorce. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea. Judea. To the other side of the Jordan, large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Mm. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man gives his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for martial unfaithfulness, and marries another woman commits adultery. Mm. The disciple said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some, from, for, for some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Hmm. The little children in Jesus. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The, the rich young man. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept. The young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. Mm -mm -mm. That's the book of Matthew chapter 19 right there. That right there is some serious, isn't it? Man, man, man. Let us review the book of Matthew chapter 19. 
So it starts off with Jesus discussing more about divorce, right? So he went over on the other side. He left Galilee and went to Judea. And a large crowd followed them, followed him, and then he healed them there. And then the Pharisees came to test him and asked about divorce and divorcing his wife for any and every reason. Now, you remember in the ancient times when it came to divorces and marriages or whatnot um, back then, they used to, men used to divorce their wives for all types of reasons, all types of reasons. That's why the Pharisee asked that. And then Jesus said, haven't you read? And he replied about, from the beginning, God made them man and female and how they should become one flesh and become one. And I love that what God said, he said, therefore, what God, what, I love what Jesus said, he said, therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. And I love that quote so much. And um, I love that scripture. And then um, the Pharisee, they just asked him about, well, Moses commanded them about a wife, a divorce of a certificate and things of that nature. It's on their way. But Jesus was saying like, hey, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for martial unfaithfulness, sexual morality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So Jesus just summed it up right just then and there. All right, there's no confusion or lack of understanding about that. That's very simple and plain. But you know, today's world, people stray away from the things that the Lord said. They want to stray away from what Jesus said. They want to do their own thing. Um, they don't want to accept what the Lord had set out for in the first place. So they want to wander off and lean on their own understanding and go off their own flesh and their lust and disobey how Jesus went about this. You know what I'm saying? Because when you look at the union today, the bond between man and woman is at an all-time low for various reasons. I mean, this is a fallen, wicked generation. This is a very perverse perverse generation. So nothing is sacred or honored no more. Unions, marriages, relationships, even communication, like everything is just at an all-time low today. So... You know, marriage is not something you see people doing no more. You don't see much marriages out here today. Like this whole dating market stuff is all weird and all over the place and has no true foundation from God and does have no substance. So that's why things are so flimsy today. But Jesus broke it down with with no problem about this. And then the disciples just said to him, like, well, it's better to not marry. But Jesus also just broke down like, hey, you know, not everyone can accept the word, but only for those whom it is given. So he's basically saying, like, your martial status is your martial status. Um, some people going to get married. Some going to be single. It's all about God's will at the end of the day and the person's situation. Because he, he goes out and says this, you know. Okay, he's saying some were eunuchs, so they were born that way. Others were made that way by men and influence of their cultures or whatever. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. So sometimes... It, it, where it says renounce marriage because of the kingdom of heaven, it, it's one of those things where it's like, hey, it might be God's will for a person to stay single or just be to themselves. Some people, it's just like that for the kingdom because with certain people, um, if they get entangled with someone or get in a relationship, it might interfere in what that person has going on for God. You get what I'm saying? Even if you marry a decent, solid person, it could still inter- mess, it could kind of mess up what you got going for God. Like God's purpose and will and desire for you may be just to be to yourself and just solely for him and just follow him all your life. But um, other people, God may want to get married. Everybody's different, all right? All in all, it's not to look at what others have or covet it or what have you. It's just about the end of the day, your relationship with the Lord is the most important relationship you can have, period, all right? And, and life, people come and go. Some people are here to stay for a reason or for a season. Everyone's either a lesson or a blessing. It is what it is, but all in all, let God's will be done when it comes to your martial status, okay? And uh, Jesus already just broke that down to the bone. And then, you know, it goes more into detail about the little children being placed in Jesus' hands for prayer. And the disciples kind of rebuked them, but Jesus was saying like, hey, the kingdom of heaven belongs to these. So God let the children in. God pray for these children, man. God to pray for these babies, man. We should never turn a child away from God. Never reject or mock someone's youth, man. You, you, you Man, you got to welcome these babies, man. Should always pray for these children, amen. And then in Matthew chapter 19, we go further and more about the young rich man and how the rich man asked Jesus, you know, what I got to do to get in her eternal life and what I have to do. And then, of course, Jesus said, keep the commandments, obey them, or what have you. And then the rich man was like, hey, I, I obeyed all these. And Jesus was like, all right, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. 
And when the young man heard it, he walked away sad and didn't want to do it. <laughs> you know, it, it just shows how much people uh, don't want to let go of things of the world, the cares of the world. People don't want to uh, let go of the old to embrace the new. You know, Jesus tried to put him on the treasures of heaven, but he wanted to keep on to the treasures of the earth. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, man, the things of heaven and the things of earth, man, they're, they, you can't even compare those two, man. You honestly can't. The things of the earth are so temporary and flimsy and very seasonal. You're talking about eternal things, heavenly, everlasting things. How can you not want that, right? But it just shows you where this person's heart was at. That's when Jesus came with the the saying of, you know, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know, and then the disciples were just like, well, then who can be saved? And he said, well, hey, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All right, so you got to want it, people. Your faith, your alignment, your choices, you got to want it. Amen. Got to want it, people. And then Peter rep- responded to Jesus and he said, we have left everything to follow you, then what will there be for us? And Jesus just breaks down the whole glorification process, the eternal life and everything. He basically saying like, hey, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or a father or a mother or children or fields, for my name's sake, for my sake, will receive a hundredfold and eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So tables are going to turn and things may not result in the way people think it's going to be. You get what I'm saying? But all in all, Jesus summed it up in that manner. You know, we got to ask ourselves, like, did we leave everything behind for Jesus to follow him? Did we cut everything and everybody off? What are we still holding on to? You know what I'm saying? Do you really want eternal life in a hundredfold? You know, did you leave behind brother, mother, sister, father, um, land, you know, child? Did you leave all that behind? Houses, fields, lands. Did you leave all that behind to follow Jesus? You know, something, you know, we all got to ask ourselves, including, you know, we all got to ask ourselves this, you know what I mean? All right. So before I go into Matthew chapter 20, I want to read this commentary that was included within Matthew 19. OK. Today's Bible reading, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. Recommended reading, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 24. The book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 30. The book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The title of this commentary is called Beyond the Good Life. When was the last time you bought a box of Kleenex, perhaps some Advil for your headache, or maybe a package of popsicles to satisfy your kids' desires for sweets? Of course, because you're a guy and most of us like to have, save a few bucks, you probably bought a box of generic facial tissues, an industrial-sized bottle labeled ibuprofen, non-aspirin pain reliever, and some grocery store brand of frozen confectionery treats. Confectionery treats. While it thrills the makers of Kleenex, Advil, and Popsicles that you remember the names of their trademark brands, they're less than thrilled when you buy an alternative product. They spend millions on advertising to build their brands to a high level of name, recognition, but then the trademark name loses its distinction and it ends up standing for all standing for all similar products. Just as brand names lose their meaning, so do words we use every day. That was the case with the, young, with the rich young man who asked Jesus about what good thing he could do to gain eternal life. Jesus even questioned why the young man used the word good. And the Lord delivered the laundry list. In essence, Jesus said that the only thing good enough to earn eternal life involves living a perfect, obedient, and selfless life, something that no man can do. However, we often overlook the two simple words that Jesus, that follow Jesus, impossible to attain list. Apparently, the rich young man did too, or maybe he consciously realized they represented an invitation he couldn't accept. Those words, follow me. In verse 21, Jesus' message remains the same today. His simple two-word directive is filled with deep and complex meaning. With those words, he calls us to go with him on his mission, to accompany him on the journey through life. 
we can't really accomplish any good on our own. We can only answer yes when Jesus says, follow me, Mm. to take away. If we have no hope of living perfect, obedient, and selfless lives, why should we bother to try? How would you respond to someone who asked, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What holds you back in your struggle to follow Jesus? What steps can you take to become a more devoted follower? Hmm. Very good commentary included there, okay? So that was the commentary based on Matthew chapter 19. Now we would go to the book of Matthew chapter 20, okay? The book of Matthew chapter 20, here we go. All right, Matthew chapter 20, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us. They answered, he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th came and each were served a denarius. So when those who came, those who came, who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received the denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the last who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Mm. Jesus again predicts his death. Now, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. A mother's request. Then the mother of Zebedee, Zebedee, Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus with her sons and, and kneeling and asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine say, sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, indeed. You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise, exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mm. The two, two blind men received sight. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked, Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. Hmm. That is the book of Matthew chapter 20 reading. Very interesting read right there. So. It starts off with Matthew 20 describing the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And it was just discussed how basically the landowner went out to hire people for his vineyard, basically. 
And he hired a group of men by each timing of the day. He hired some early in the day, the middle of the day, and then the last one's light at night. And then Wanda, and they all received uh, a reward for each that they all have done throughout the day. And, you know, the work in the parable, the workers, the early workers who worked all day in the sun were angry because they got not only paid last, but also because everybody got given the same amount. And the workers were getting angry about it, like, well, we should have gotten more because we worked in a day and this, this, and that. So they had, like, their reasons and their entitlement or what have you. But um, the landlord was just like, hey, you can't tell me to do it with my money. <laughs> you know, he's also just uh, breaking that whole scenario situation down. But what Jesus was trying to get out of that parable is basically saying, like, hey, the last will be first and the first will be last. So when it comes to putting our hands in work for the kingdom of heaven, right, we shouldn't have that covetous mindset or competitive mindset towards one another or thinking we should have more than the other or less than the other. We shouldn't have that mindset. Um, it's not really elitist mindset to have. It's very prideful and haughtiness. And it's kind of like an entitlement thing because at the end of the day, um, you're the worker, not the owner. You get what I'm saying? And basically, when we're working for the kingdom of heaven, right, um, everybody's going to get their just due. They're going to get their reward. Like, in a sense, when you read Revelations, right, it discusses about who's who with the two witnesses, the 144, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 24 elders, um, the all nations, all tribes, all languages, all people, all four corners of the earth. So the Lord already established everything on a prof- in a prophetic sense, right? So, And also, when you read throughout the New Testament, it talks about different crowns. Like, um, there's five crowns, like the crown of life. Um, there's five different types of crowns. I got to do a, a message about that later on someday. But so everybody's going to have their own reward and justice due when it's all said and done. Um, whether someone was serving God their whole entire lives or when someone was serving God at the later time of their lives, at the end of the day, we all get rewarded a certain way. You get what I'm saying? So let us not be holding up one another or on our journeys for the Lord as we're on this path, okay? When you read Matthew 20, it goes more further about Jesus predicting his death and how he'd be betrayed and handed over. And then it goes further to the mother's request. The mother of Zabidi's sons was talking about one sit at one side of him and the other sit on the other side. And Jesus is basically saying, like, hey, I'm not here to be served. I'm here to, to serve. You know, Jesus had to put emphasis on that and let them know what it is. I mean, he, Jesus was also basically saying, like, um, you know, the, these places belong to those for whom that have been prepared by my father. So Jesus is saying, like, God is in control of the position and everything. You know, he's not in the control of all of that. Um, he's just there to be served and be have his life given as a ransom for many. You know, so he had to explain that to Zabidi's mother. And the disciples were a bit annoyed by that. <laughs> all that, like, partial favoritism and all, they got annoyed by that. And Jesus letting them know, like, hey, um, there shouldn't be no special treatment or favoritism about this. You know, the kingdom of heaven is bigger than that. You get what I'm saying? And um, when we go into Matthew chapter 20, it goes more further in detail about how the two men, the two blind men received their sight. You know, it's important that we cry out to the Lord. You know, as they yelled and cried out and shouted to the Lord, you know, and the Lord had compassion on them. He had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately they received their sight and followed him. All right. And that happened as they were leaving Jericho. So even when Jesus and the disciples were doing the works, they were doing it within Israel and outside of Israel as well. So when it comes to faith, healing, deliverance, miracles, blessings, there's no limit to that. So And, and when you read that part, the crowd wanted them to shut up and stay quiet. But you should never shut somebody up who wants the things of God. If somebody's crying out for the Lord, why would you want them to shut up for? You get what I'm saying? If someone needs help, someone's crying out for the power of God, a miracle, healing, or what have you, how can you withhold somebody from that? All right. So let us never withhold somebody from wanting the things of God. If anything, we should encourage it and always persuade someone to go after the things of God. Amen. We should always want somebody to go after healing, deliverance. We should always want somebody to go after the power of God or wanting some type of encounter with them. Okay. Because God gives freely and abundantly when it comes to his love, his mercy, his power, his spirit, all those things. Amen. So that's just amazing how Jesus healed their eyes and they followed him. All right. So that's the book of Matthew chapter 20 reading. 
Now let us go into the book of Matthew, chapter 21. All right. The book of Matthew, chapter 21. Here we go. Oh, hold on. Sorry for that, y'all. Before I go into Matthew chapter 21, there was a commentary I actually skipped in between these pages. I want to just go right back to that commentary and read it with you all. All right. So here we go. All right. The title of this commentary is called Glory, Then Tragedy, John the Baptist. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 3. The prisoners shuffled over to the crack in the wall, where some light filtered through into the gloom of his cold cell. Not that different from our caves over by the Dead Sea. He consoled himself, but at least there were at least their one could come out into the blazing light and be warmed. Not here, I wonder if I'll ever come out again. For anyone, a prison cell is terrible, I suppose, but all my life I've lived outdoors. I'm afraid I'm losing my mind in this dark, closed-in place. What did I just send those disciples to ask him? Whether he really is the one we're waiting for or whether we should look for someone else? Did I really say that? His herald, I, who have spent my entire life telling everyone else to get ready for his arrival. I must be losing my mind. Of course, he's the coming one. I saw the spirit descended upon him. I heard the father proclaim him. He paced back and forth in the confining space, trying to get his circulation going, and perhaps with it more clarity of thought. My mother used to tell me that I recognized him while we were both yet unborn. He smiled grimly. When he came to me to be baptized just like everybody else, I was overwhelmed. I knew our roles should be reversed, but he assured me that this was the right thing for that moment. A wave of images fluttered through the Baptist's mind as he recalled the halcyon, halcyon days of his ministry by the Jordan. When everyone from religious leaders to Roman soldiers sought his counsel and humbled themselves in response to his calls for repentance, then after Jesus went public, the crowd started to dwindle. He remembered, or rather to follow him instead of me, as well as they should have. Still, our little band did feel smaller and less significant as the crowd shifted allegiance. And then came my arrest. Of course, it was to be expect expected. I've always spoken the truth about righteousness to the lowly and to the great. Herod respected that, but his wife couldn't stand it. She still can't bear that he calls me in to talk with him so often. I see her smoldering there in the corner, and I know she bears me no goodwill. But Messiah has come, hasn't he? He will right all wrongs, make the rough places smooth, correct those in error, and bring universal justice. Perhaps he'll even get me out of here. And yet, even if he doesn't, I pray that I've done what God has expected of me. Mm. Back to the future. In what ways has God proven his goodness to you in the past? Why does God allow us to suffer? Why do you think he doesn't free us from all pain and discomfort in this life? Do difficult times ever make you doubt God? Why is it sometimes tough? Why is it sometimes tough to maintain a steady faith that trust in God through comfortable and difficult times? The story continues for more on John the Baptist. Read Matthew chapter three, verses one through 17. The book of Matthew chapter 11, verse one, verses one through 19. The book of Matthew chapter 14, verses one through 12. The book of Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45, also verses 57 through 80. And the book of John chapter 1, verses 19 through 37, also the book of John chapter 3, verses, chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. So that is the devotional reading and the uh, commentary, including John the Baptist of what he went through and experienced within just that time period alone, okay? Something to reflect on, amen? Yes, yes, y'all. So now let us go into the book of Matthew, chapter 21. The triumphal entry. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Beth Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her, Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, 
and he will send them right away. This place, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that f- followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus at the temple. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Mm. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouted in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were angry. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. The fig tree withers. Early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Hello. Hey, now. Okay, now. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Come on, people. The authority of Jesus questioned. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will ask you, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of people for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Hmm. The parable of the two sons. What do you think? There was a man who was who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. And the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of these two, which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Mm, Oof. Okay, now, for John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him but the tax collectors and prostitutes did and even after you saw this you did not repent and believe him Mm. the parable of the tenants listen to another parable there was a landowner who planted a vineyard he put a wall around it dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated him the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, let me repeat that. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? 
He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he who on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Mm -mm -mm. That's the book of Matthew chapter 21 reading right there. I just love how Jesus humbled those chief priests and those Pharisees, man. I love how he always humbled them and put them in a place. You know, when you oppose the truth, you oppose the son of man. When you oppose the will of God and the gospel, you will get humbled and put in your place. All right. And that was the book of Matthew 21 reading. Very good read. Excuse me. It basically discussed how when he came to Jerusalem, um, you know, he came up on a donkey and fulfilled prophecy just through that as well. And then also what he did, he went through the city and the people were happy and amazed at him. And it was a great, great moment to capture. And then Jesus also went to the temple and started flipping them tables there and saying, hey, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Man, this is so relevant today with all these certain places and mega churches and all these so-called big buildings and facilities. Um, they have definitely turned it into a den of robbers. All right. See, stuff like that. See, this is the reason why people today don't want to fellowship no more or don't want to go to church no more, things of that nature, because they see how worldly it is, how materialistic it could be, how sinful it is. You get what I'm saying? And there hasn't been enough good examples for people to want to stay at a fellowship or gathering. But in this world, this is a very big world. There are still a few true ministries out there, okay? There's still a few good churches out there, okay? There are still a few good that really hold it down, okay? So don't just generalize every single church. I think that's unfair because there's some peer ministries out here um, that still do it God's way, all right? But to the ones who are materialistic and serving money and things of that nature, uh, they will get their judgment. They will get theirs, all right? So um, if you're able to still fellowship and gather and go to church to a nice, decent, honest church, man, that's a blessing in itself because churches are getting more empty by the day. More people are straying away from the faith and getting into the new age and um, all types of different religion, belief systems, or what have you. But um, if you could find a, a solid, true church, a solid, pure ministry, um, that's a blessing in itself, okay? There's still a few remaining left in these last days, okay? A real remaining few that's going to hold it down. So if you're still able to fellowship, do that, all right? Hold it down, people. So let's see what we're going, through, what we're going to find through Matthew 21. And Jesus is talking about the fig tree and how it withered. And then, um, yeah, so I just like the main part of Matthew 21 when he just really was uh, putting those chief priests and those elders in his place. And they're just putting those Pharisees in their place because they kept opposing the most high son. They kept giving him issues. And the Lord just kept hitting them with the gospel and the truth and parables. And he even told them, he says, hey, you know, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom ahead of you. So he letting them know, like, you can look down on people all you want, but they're going to get into the kingdom before you. <laughs> you see? So people, let us always humble ourselves before the Lord and not look down on anybody at all because God can use anybody for his glory and his purpose. Amen? Yes, yes. So I just love that parable as well where uh, Jesus said about in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done it, has done this, and is marvelous in our eyes, you know? And um, he's just saying how the kingdom is going to be given to people that will produce fruit out of it. Because many people out here are unfruitful. They're not producing any fruit. But to the real ones out there, all four corners of the earth doing this work, God bless you all. Much love to you all. Amen. So that wraps up the book of Matthew chapter 21 reading. All right. What I would love to do before I get into Matthew chapter 22, I want to read this commentary that's included within the pages. Okay. So here we go. 
All right, the title of this commentary is called A Humble King. All right. Today's Bible reading, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. Recommended reading, the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. The book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. The book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Also, the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 24 through 31. All right, so with these commentaries, do not get so hung up on it. These are just different perspectives and worldly views kind of mixed in with lessons of the gospel. So let's just go through it. A humble king. In June 2002, Queen Elizabeth II celebrated 50 years at Great Britain's monarch. Monarch. The nation threw a huge party, the Golden Jubilee Fest Festival, with 20,000 performers participating. The royal family and a crowd of a million people watched as very varied entries such as giant food, plates, 50 Hell's Angels, representatives of five decades of London taxis, scantily dressed butterflies, and even a dancing Taj Mahal paraded down London Ceremonial Mall. In comparison, the parade for an earlier king was much more humble. This procession took place in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the, a week before Jesus died. The King Jesus rode into a town on a donkey. True, even the celebration required attention to details. A donkey, a colt, cloaks to cover the animals, palm tree branches, and crowds. But these elements seem so minor. As guys, we'd want Jesus to entry into the city to be the biggest and best parade ever. We want to proclaim, here comes the king. Yet this episode portrays very little of Christ's kingly authority and power. We wonder, why did Jesus arrive on a donkey? Why did he act so unkingly after the parade and even to go on to cause a disturbance in the temple? Why were his most enthusiastic supporters a group of disabled people and a bunch of kids? A bunch of children throughout his gospel, Matthew explains that Jesus is God's promised king. As Jesus' earthly life and ministry near their end, Matthew wants to remove all doubts about who the king is and why he came to rescue us from sin. However, like the religious leaders and crowds on the early on that early Palm Sunday, excuse me, excuse me, we can easily misunderstand Jesus. In the craziness of everyday life, we can carelessly forget just how great and powerful our king is. Mm. Amid the hustle of family and work, we can quickly grow complacent about all he has done and continues to do for us. Human emperors and kings come and go. Queen Elizabeth occupied Britain's throne for more than 50 years, yet that's just a wink of time in comparison to eternity. Mm. Jesus reigns as king forever. As his royal subjects, we can shout our sincere praise. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Mm. That's powerful right there. Mm -hmm. To take away. If you took charge of planning a celebration and parade for Jesus, God's promised king, what would the event include and why? Hmm. Why do you think Jesus' triumph, triumphal entry into Jerusalem was actually a humble entrance? As you think of Jesus as king, does this perspective affect how you approach him with your needs? Does it make a difference in your efforts to follow and obey him? What can you do to increase his reign in your life? That's a very excellent commentary reading because it's comparing how a worldly king, an earthly king or a queen or what have you, earthly royalty is always vain and show offy and flashy and prideful, haughty, you know, and very much over the top, right? But when Jesus entered Jerusalem, it was a subtle, you know, like a vet. It was prophetic, of course, powerful, but it wasn't vain. It wasn't show offy. It was just a donkey, a colt, you know, cloaks, things like that. So what that's trying to emphasize, put emphasis on is that with Jesus is the humble king and he wasn't into vain things and prideful things and, and to uh, show off things, man. He was all about purpose and reasoning and the Lord and people. That's how, that's all he was about. And that's how we have to be in our walks with God. You know what I'm saying? We can't be vain and in the things that we do. Amen. So the humble king, that's a very great commentary to add about that. You know, Jesus didn't pull up in a chariot 
He didn't pull up in horses. He he could have pulled up in any style he wanted to. He decided to go on the donkey. So that's the type of king we serve right there. Amen. A humble king that died for our sins. Ain't that something? If you're going to die for somebody's sins, you just pull up in a donkey, right? Why why get all fancy and dressed up? You just pull up like, hey, <laughs> right? So all in a very historical, prophetical thing, man, and very prophetic and that's just amazing on the king that we serve, amen. We serve a humble king, all right? So that's the book of Matthew chapter 21 reading. Now let us go into the book of Matthew chapter 22, all right? The book of Matthew chapter 22, here we go. The parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. Mm. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you found, anyone you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. That's a parable right there. Let us continue the book of Matthew, chapter 15. Paying taxes to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with Heredians. Herodians, teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intention, evil, evil intent said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying a tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Marriage at the Resurrection, Matthew chapter 22, verses 23. That same day, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God has said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Mm. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The true and living one, y'all. The greatest commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with his question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind, all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Mm. Whose son is the Christ? While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ? 
whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> so that's the book of Matthew chapter 22 reading. Very nice reading as we review uh, the book of Matthew chapter 22 reading. Um, it starts off with the parable of the wedding banquet. And Jesus basically describing the kingdom of heaven as a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And that's more of a correlation of the father and the son, right? And the invitations are being sent out. But nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to attend. Nobody wants to show up. Everybody wants to do their own thing. And it gets interesting in Matthew 22, verse 5. He says, But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there was not wearing wedding, or cl wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him and foot, tie him hand and foot, and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. <laughs> That's basically showing, hey man, you gotta show up with your lamps and your oil, the all white robes, man. Hey man, those who say, Lord, Lord, ain't getting in. A lot of people gonna get to depart from me, never knew you. A lot of people are going to tell you, eternal life, man, the everlasting fire, the lake of fire, man. This stuff is very serious. The spiritual warfare is serious, y'all. We got to get right with the Lord, man. We got to get right. Got to get the proper attire. We have to show up to the wedding, man. Got to be on point, people. Got to have the armor of God. Got to live for the Lord forever, man. You know? It said weeping and gnashing of teeth into the darkness. <laughs> man, we got to get it right, y'all. He said, many are invited, but few are chosen. Make sure you're part of that, man. You don't want to go to hell, man. Some serious stuff, man. You know, right? So that was Matthew chapter 22. And it goes on about paying tax to Caesar. And Jesus was already peeping their evil intent and their sarcasm and their mockery in that question. And Jesus was just like, hey, you know, whatever belongs to Caesar, give to Caesar. And whatever belongs to God, give it to God, you know. And then they also discussed about the marriage at the resurrection and uh, the, the Pharisees and the law debaters and the Sadducees were just asking about um, about the marriage and the Moses situation and what happens if one goes and marrying the other. And Jesus just replied and just said, hey, you are an Arab because of because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. He said at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Mm. When the crowds heard us, they were astonished at his teaching. So, talking about the glorification process, new heavenly bodies, and things of that nature, okay? And then in Matthew chapter 22, it goes further about the greatest commandment. Um the Sadducees and the Pharisees got together and just asked them, like, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Now, mind you, it asked the greatest commandment. It didn't ask the first commandment because shout out to my homeboy Street Baptism on his YouTube channel. Y'all should check it out. He did a great breakdown of message and video about this topic right here. And I just watched the video recently and he broke it down very well and made some very great points about it. And he went to the Old Testament and New Testament about it. And um, it was a good breakdown he had because you notice it says the greatest commandment. It didn't say the first commandment. Because when you read the first commandments, the first one says, um, you shall have no other gods before me. You, you know, that was like the first one, you know. But the, the Pharisees asked him the greatest one. And then Jesus replied and just said, well, hey, 
Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and soul, strength, and might. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like you said, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You know, so that was that was a very um, good uh, answer that Jesus replied with. All right, and then Jesus proved him wrong more about the whole Christ Lord and Father situation and things of that nature. Because the Pharisees was like, "Well, what do you think of well, whose son is he? What do you think about the Christ?" No, no. When the, when the Pharisees were gathered, Jesus asked them, "What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he?" They said, the son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, Christ, he always had a humorous way of making the Pharisees look dumb, man. Because them Pharisees and them Sadducees. They try so hard to win debates and arguments and be sarcastic and mocking him and all this different stuff. And Christ just kept defeating him with the word over and over and over again. You notice he didn't put hands on them. He didn't get up in their face. He just hit them with the word. The word is your sword, man. The arm of God, that word is your sword. That is your weapon, people. That word, man. God stand that word, people. All right. So what I would love to do before I read the book of Matthew chapter 23 is I would like to read this commentary based on Matthew 22, okay? So here we go. All right, let's go through this commentary. Today's Bible reading, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Recommended reading, the book of Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. The book of Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. And the book of Romans chapter 11, Verses 13 through 22. Have you RSVEP'd? RSVP'd? Are you invited? Have you been invited? As guys, we often forget to RSVP. Say that some friends invite you to a formal New Year's Eve party. At the bottom of the invitation, you read, Please RSVP. Respondes, Ciel vos plait. Or in plain English, Please let us know whether or not you're coming. The hosts want to know how many people will attend their celebration. This isn't much of an issue when the hosts are planning a Super Bowl party. When they know there will be people coming and going, and when they're planning on having insane amounts of food available anyway. It becomes more of an issue, however, if the host, however, if the host is planning a catered dinner party. If you don't RSVP and then do show up, there's a big problem as if you RSVP and then don't make an appearance. Jesus told the story of a king who sent out invitations to a wedding feast. What a great honor to be invited. But even when personal represent, rep representatives of the king delivered the invitations, invitations, some people ignored them. Even worse, others harmed and killed the king's messengers. Mm. Insulted and angry, the king sent soldiers to kill these originally invited guests. What an interesting choice these people had. Attend the king's wedding, feast, or die. This story points to an even greater invitation, one that God sends to each of us. He invites us to enter the kingdom of heaven. His invitation requires a response, an RSVP to God. Perhaps you've already accepted God's invitation. If not, Jesus continues to invite you. Each day he shows up in your life and asks you to join him at the heavenly celebration. Like the guests, the king's servants gather them from the street, gather from the streets. None of us deserves this invitation to establish a relationship with God. God loves us so much that he invites everyone to his party, but few accept the invitation. How will you RSVP? Mm, 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 mm. To take away, how does the story of the wedding feast help you understand God's desire to have a personal relationship with you? Why do you think the original invited, the originally invited guests in the parable killed the king's messengers? Are you willing to become a representative of the king, someone who delivers God's invitation to others? What risk do you face? Wow. Powerful, powerful commentary right there. That parable is so powerful with the wedding banquet and the king invited to his people to his son's wedding. 
it's just a reflection of the father, the wedding feast of the lamb, his son, and he sends out prophets and messengers to spread the gospel and to send out the invites. And then some of them even got killed along the way just for bringing out the message of Christ. <laughs> Ain't that something? But further in that parable, it gets more intense because someone did show up to it, but they weren't in wedding attire and they got thrown out into the darkness, into the gnashing of teeth and fire, T- gnashing of teeth and fire. So people, 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 man, accept the invitation to Christ, man, and, and accept it and go, man. Show up to the wedding feast of the land, people. Show up, people. Show up. Amen. So that was the book of Matthew chapter 22 reading. Now let us go to the book of Matthew chapter 23. All right. The book of Matthew chapter 23. Here we go. Matthew 23, seven woes. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Mm. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Mm. Oh, boy. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their philosophies. They make their flasteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you only have, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces, in men's faces you yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Oof. Woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? Mm. You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Mm. Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Mm. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. (laughs) Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones mm, and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy, hypocrisy and wickedness. Mm. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You blind tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. Mm, You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. 
Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth. From the blood excuse me, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those that sent to you, stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm-mm-mm. That's the book of Matthew chapter 23 reading. You know what's the crazy part? As I was reading this, that thunder and rain just popped in as soon as I was reading this. <laughs> Matthew 23, boy, that one right there, the seven woes. He was going in on them Pharisees and the teachers of the law, boy. Them hypocrites, man. Man, 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 he was going in. He was going in, boy. He really went off on him. And that's even more prevalent to this day. These people that spread the false gospels, false doctrines, these camps on the corners. Mm. A lot of these religious people, they, they, I'm telling you, man, the Lord going to get them, man. They're going to get them. Most high is going to get them, man. Mm-mm-mm. He He just went in on them, man. He went in. This don't even really need no commentary or interpretation to be honest. This is as brief as you can. But through Matthew 23, honestly, uh, he was just really going off on them. And he was just saying, like, you don't call anybody rabbi. For you only have one master. You don't call anybody father. You only have one father, heavenly father that's in heaven. You don't know how to call anybody a teacher. Only Christ is your teacher. Amen. So, you know. It's it's important, man. Jesus was just talking to the crowds and disciples. He's just saying, like, hey, don't be following after these men. These men are blind. It's a blind leading the blind. These men are going to have you lost in the sauce. Don't follow them. Follow me and follow what I'm showing you and telling you. You get what I'm saying? So I just love how in Matthew 23, Jesus is just saying, like, don't be following after man and, and man's words and man's traditions and being religious and, and dogmatic, you get what I'm saying, and robotic about this, because you're going to miss out on the kingdom of heaven. You're going to miss out on salvation and eternal life. You're going to miss out on those things if you keep following man. Man is always bringing confusion and misleading people. They want to be right all the time. You see what I'm saying? And the, the law debaters, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, they, they still here to this day. Them camps on the corner, them, them fake preachers, the mega pastors, them People who's not speaking sound doctrine, people not speaking true gospel, that's who they are. That's basically the main ones Jesus was rebuking and going at. You get what I'm saying? So, got to understand, man. All right? And Jesus even, tell, even said, like, hey, man, be clean on the inside. Then the outside will be clean, you know? To be, you've got to be good inside out, people. Got to be better, man. Can't be looking good and holy and all that on the outside, but then deep down, it's a bunch of darkness and evil and wickedness. That's how a lot of people are here, man. These wolves in sheep's clothing, bro. It's too many of that today. And, and see, stuff like that is make it makes people not want to follow God when they keep seeing all these wrong, bad examples. They keep seeing all these misleading people. You know, even a person who's not even a believer can see how these people be capping and full of it. You see what I'm saying? So, people, let us really walk in the power of God. Let us really be moved by the Holy Spirit. Let us follow Christ only. That's it. We ain't falling after no man out here. Nobody. No idolatry, no silly stuff, man. All right? So that's the book of Matthew chapter 23, okay? Now let us get into the book of Matthew chapter 24. Honestly, this is one of my like favorite scriptures I like to actually quote out of a lot of this. This is a heavy one right here, and it's super relevant to this day, okay? The book of Matthew chapter 24, here we go. Signs of the end of the age. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Mm. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, 
for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, mm, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but to see it, that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be fam famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Mm. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will return away. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. <laughs> and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. <laughs> because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Mm. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Mm -hmm. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that caused desolation spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Mm -mm -mm. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or, in the, or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, mm. and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. Mm. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Mm, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words ne will never pass away. The day and hour unknown. No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Mm. As it was in the days of Noah, so it would be at the, sun at the coming of the son of man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it would be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Mm. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It would be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth. He will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time. My, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to be his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. 
the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him in a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As soon as I said that, that thunder hitting outside. <laughs> man, oh man, that's the book of Matthew chapter 24 reading. Mm-mm-mm. Boy, that is a lot right there. This is happening very quickly, ain't it? Spirit, this spiritual warfare is really getting intense. Matthew 24 is just beyond relevant, amen? Man, oh man, the signs of the end of the age. Yeah, that Matthew 24 is always a, a heavy read. So heavy, you know. She's so looking at the world as it is today. You see the direction it's going and where we at as a people, as a humanity, sake, as a society. It's at a very all-time low, man, when it comes to how we treat each other, how we communicate, our morals, our integrity, our mannerisms, just everything, man. It's just a lot of discord and dysfunction and a lot of chaos, all right? But we're going to stay firm and strong for the Lord, and we're going to trust in him through it all and endure to the end and persevere, man, and keep seeking him, amen? So that's the book of Matthew, chapter 24, reading. That's very brief and plain. I don't even got to add no commentary interpretation of that. That's just as bold as it is, amen? So what I love to do as I close out is give all the glory to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and pray His only begotten Son who died for our sins. Amen. Here we go. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, y'all. He is the hope for humanity. He is the Adam, the second Adam, the last Adam, the advocate, the almighty, true and living God, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. The apostle of our profession, the arm of the Lord, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the author and finisher of our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith, the author of life, the author of salvation, the beginning and the end, the beginning of creation of God, the beloved son, the blessing only potent, the blessing only ruler, the branch, the bread of God, the bread of life, the bridegroom, the capstone, the captain of salvation, the chief cornerstone, the chief shepherd, Christ, the Christ of God, the constellation of Israel, the cornerstone, the counselor. Wonderful Counselor, the Creator, the Dayspring, the Deliverer, the Desire of the Nations, the Door, the Elect of God, Emmanuel, the Eternal Life, the Everlasting Father, the Faith and True Witness, Faithful and True, the Faithful Witness, the First and the Last, the First Begotten, the First Born from the Dead, the First Born of all creation, the Forerunner, the Gate, the Glory of the Lord, God, the Good Shepherd, the Great High Priest, the Great Shepherd, the Head of the Church, the Heir of all things, the High Priest, Holy and True, the Holy One, the Hope, the Hope of Glory, the Horn of Salvation, the I am, the I am that I am, the image of God, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jireh, Jehovah, Shalom, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the judge of Israel, the judge, King Eternal. He is a king of Israel. Hosanna, Hosanna. He is a king of kings. Amen. He is a king of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. The king of saints, king of the ages, king of the Jews, the king, the lamb, the lamb of God, the lamb without blemish, the last Adam, the lawgiver, the leader and commander, the life, the lie of the world the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the living one, the living stone, the Lord. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my redeemer. The Lord is my salvation. He is my strength. He is my everything. Yes, the Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my high tower. Yes, the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, Yah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahweh, Shai, Yahweh, Ben Yahweh, 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 Yeshua, Hamashiach, Barakatha, Shalom, Shalom, Yeshua, Elohim, Yes, yes, he is a consuming fire, a high Yeshaya. Yes, yes, he is the great physician, can heal all things, the carpenter, can fix all things. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Much much glory to the God of heaven and earth. His son sits at the right hand of him. He is, the, the government does rest on his shoulders. Yes, the God of heaven and earth. He is the father of lights, the father of mercies, the father of the fatherless, the father of widows. Yes, he is the Lord of all. The Lord of glory, the Lord of lords, the man from heaven, the man of sorrows, the mediator of the new covenant, the mediator, the messenger of the covenant, the Messiah, the mighty God, the mighty one, the morning star, the Nazarene, the offspring of David, the only begotten son of God, our great God and savior, our holiness, our spiritual husband, our Passover, our protection, our redemption, our righteousness, our sacrifice, the Passover lamb, the power of God, the precious cornerstone, the prince of kings, the prince of life, the prince of peace, the prophet, the redeemer the resurrection and life, the resurrector. He is the life. He is the revelation, the revelator. He is the righteous branch, the righteous one, the radiant one, the perfect example, 
the rock, the root of David, the rose of Sharon, the ruler of God's creation, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the savior, the seed of woman, the shepherd and bishop of souls, the Shiloh, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of God, the son of man, son of the blessed, son of the most high God, the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, the son of righteousness, the just one, the one mediator, the stone the builders rejected, the true bread, the true God, the true light, the true vine. Yes, he is the truth. Amen. He is the way. Hallelujah. He is the way, truth, and life, the wisdom of God, the witness, the wonderful counselor, the word, the word of God, the word of Yahuwah, the word of Elohim, the word of Yeshua HaMashiach, the word of Yahweh Shai, the word of Yehosha Yahusha. Yes, he is the word of life, y'all, the word of Elohim. He is the word. Amen. We touch and agree. Yes, yes, we serve an awesome creator, and the Son is amazing for dying for our sins. Yes, yes, y'all, boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord. Yes, tell everybody how great he is, amen, what he got you through. His son is just so awesome, ain't it? By the blood, by the blood, by his blood. Yes, yes, y'all, by his stripes we are healed. The son is just too awesome. He is a seed of Abraham, promise, seed of Adam, humanity, seed of David, kingship, Seed of God, deity. Seed of Jacob, nationality. Seed of Judah, tribe. Seed of Shem, race. Seed of woman, prophecy. Amen. In the authority and the power of the name of Jesus Christ, you are healed, renewed, restored, redeemed, forgiven, embraced, delivered, new mind, new heart, new soul, new hands to prosper, new footsteps, new life, new, new paths, new beginnings, new seasons, fresh starts, new miracles, new signs, new wonders, new dreams, new visions. All right. Let's get to it, y'all. Steadfast. Strength. Stability, I'll speak those things over your life. Stability, breakthroughs. Yes, yes, y'all. Strength and love, strength and love to you all. Sound mind. Yes, yes, walking in the word, obedience. I speak obedience over your life. Obedience, faithfulness, steadfastness, stability, amen. We touch and agree, y'all. Yes, yes. All right, so you have it, all right. That's the word for today. Book of Matthew reading, real, real intense readings right there, amen. All right, so that was the book of Matthew chapter readings of chapter 17 through 24, okay? Very excellent readings. I hope that you all can, you know, dig in the word for yourselves, read it for yourselves, and just always get the edification, the clarity, the answers. All right, read the word with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit guide you. Meditate on the word. Make sure you have no unforgiveness in your heart as you're reading, okay? Coming into God's presence, coming to his word, make sure you come in holy and on point, alert and sober and Ready to take in his word, amen, and apply it to your life and be a do of the word, amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So there you have it. I pray to God that whoever listens this message, I pray that you repent, you get baptized, you get delivered, you get set free, you start over, you stop backsliding, and you become who God called you to be. You become that new creature in Christ. You become born again, and you put your hands to the plow and start doing a whole bunch of work for the kingdom of heaven, amen. What I love to do as we close out is give you all this priestly blessing on the way out. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. I'm Jarvis Kingston. I got much love for you all. I love you all so much. Praying for you all. Peace. <laughs>